<laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> this is the strong look. <laughs> Bob, let's see you try to pull this look off. Alright, today, today, we're hitting Great Depression, New Deal, World War II. Uh, we are going to hit the Depression, well we've already hit it. Uh, we're going to finish up the New Deal. Really specifically what we're hitting is all these critics of the New Deal and the second New Deal legislation. All right, the idea is to get us all the way up to World War II. You can view my lecture on World War II. At least the um, war mobilization efforts. Do I look good? Oh, yeah. Cooking with peanut oil. So, um, if you want to look at this, this is on Itzel already, Unit 7 folder. Go Raiders. So, we take a look at our standards. Uh, we've already knocked out causes of the Great Depression. We've already knocked out Hoover's administration responses. Today, uh, we are going to finish up with this new deal. Uh, we're going to talk labor union, uh, or I should say labor and union recognition. Um, and, and once we get past the review portion of today, uh, we'll get right into the, uh, the critics from both the right and the left, and we'll explain what makes right and what makes left. So, let's move. We talked Hoover versus Smith. Um, why does Hoover win this thing in a landslide? Yeah, largely the economy is doing great in 28, uh, and the Republicans are, are, are credited with that. Uh, we talked about the Federal Reserve regulating U.S. banks. People believe in the 1920s that if we ever have an economic downturn, the Federal Reserve can pull us out by doing what? Good. Lowering that rediscount rate. Um, talked about the consumer culture growing uh, in the 1920s. Largely that's because people are making about how much more income? Yeah, about per capita, 30% more income through the 1920s. Uh, we talked about speculation, we talked about Ponzi schemes, land boom, uh, the, the stock market of the 1920s, we're calling it the what? Yeah, the great bull market. Remember, what makes, him, what makes the market a bull market? 20%. A 20% increase from below. Um, are people looking at these economic flaws? Are these the same flaws that have led us into nearly every other panic? Yes. But people don't look at it. They're only looking at the Dow. That's a mistake. Um, the stock market crash. Is it a one-day event? No. no. You know, we can see that it actually is a multi-year uh, phenomenon. Does the stock market crash itself cause the Great Depression? No. What does the stock market crash lead to? A recession. Good. A recession. And, and what two things go up in a recession? I'm sorry. Check that. What two things go down in a recession? GDP and corporate earnings. Those are the two things that go down. What goes up? Yeah, unemployment goes up. And so that's what we're dealing with. Um, Hoover, remember, he's pushing voluntary cooperation. Does he believe it's the responsibility of the federal government? Absolutely not. Um, Smoot Holly, that recession plus the Smoot Holly tariff. Puts us right into what? Yeah, Great Depression. Why? What's the problem with this Smoot Valley tariff? It creates a tariff war. Yeah, it creates a tariff war, and why is that problematic for industry and agriculture? Yeah, you know, we've got that overproduction and underconsumption. So, we also talked about banking panic. Uh, people are making a run on the banks. Uh, is this phenomenon isolated to just the United States? No, remember this depression here, we got a lot of cycles all matching up, uh, and it is a worldwide depression. Um, the veterans, they wanted their, their bonus. Is Hoover interested in giving it to them? No, remember he makes that huge blunder by sending in, who all was it? MacArthur, Ike, and Patton in to, to remove our vets. Um, huge blunder, it's going to come back and blow up in his face in the next election. Uh, Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl, uh, that's also going to, well, be terrible for our, our farmers. Um, 
it's going to affect how many states? Six, Six states uh, specifically, and it's going to cause a, a migration in what direction? Yeah, a lot of people are going west. Okay. Hoovervilles, um, that unemployment, a lot of people are losing homes. Remember, they're buying things that they couldn't afford, um, and when those things got foreclosed on them, they were forced to live where? Yeah, those shanty towns, the Hoovervilles. Um, 32, does Hoover look good for re-election? No. What is he telling the American public? Don't vote for FDR. Yeah, if you vote for FDR, he's going to change everything. Is that what the people want to hear? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so, Roosevelt wins in an absolute landslide in 32. Um, we talked about Joseph Zangara shooting at Roosevelt. Um, will Roosevelt get hit? No. No. Um, but the mayor of Chicago does. Good. Um, actually, he dies. And so, Zangara, he gone. In, in his um, <coughs> inaugural speech, he gives the fear itself speech. What is he telling the American public? What does that speech do to the American psyche? Yeah, it gives us confidence. Okay, um, he comes in with with a whole bunch of, of issues that need to be taken care of um, in terms of banking. We know we've got that banking panic. Uh, what is FDR going to declare to keep people from pulling money out of the banks? Bank holidays. Uh, remember, 32 states. Uh, this bank holiday is going to last for four days. Uh, we've got prohibition. Is prohibition working? No. And so, you know, we'll, we've talked about that. Farming's not doing well. Unemployment is really high, and industry's in the same boat as as farming. Take a look at our New Deal programs there, um, and then get down to brass tacks for banking. We get that Emergency Banking Act. What is the Emergency Banking Act doing? What is the Treasury Department doing? Supervising banks. Yeah, they're supervising that reopening of banks. Um, in order for a bank to reopen, what has to happen? Yeah, now they're going to check the books and make sure that there have been some solid banking practices. No predatory lending, uh, no absurd uh, margin loans going on. And, and so if that happens, uh, or if the bank is good, it gets to reopen. We talked about FDR's go-to method of, of talking to the American people. How does, he, how does he prefer to address the people? Yeah, through the radio. He's got that smooth voice. Uh, he gives that fireside chat. Uh, well, really his first big one um, here for the Emergency Banking Act. Does it get the American public uh, back into the banks? Yes. Absolutely. And we're going to start to see uh, that banking panic turn around. Okay. Um, we talked glass to gall. Uh, what does glass to gall do? There you go. Yes, yeah. separating the Federal Reserve member banks from, in general, the stock market. Okay, we can see all the ins and outs there. Farm legislation. Uh, it says here uh, FDR was attempting to create a paradigm shift. What is a paradigm shift? Changing the way they, yeah, they approach their business, the way they think. What was the problem with farming? They were yeah, Same problem as industry. We've got what? Overproduction coupled with <coughs> underconsumption. And when you have that, the price of your goods does what? It decreases. Okay, it decreases. Now, we've got this Farm Credit Association uh, that he puts through. The Farm Credit Association is designed to, remember I called it nearly a safety net for farmers. Why did I call it that? Refinances their mortgage. Yeah, allows them to refinance the mortgages, uh, making sure that those farmers get to stay on their farms. Now, in order to fix the price issue, he passes the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Uh, three parts, well at least three major parts to this. What's the first one? Yep, we are going to basically, yeah, pay farmers to produce less. Uh, how are we going to get the money to pay those farmers? Yeah, putting that tax on product processors. And then the third part, 
quotas. Okay, we talked about there's a there, there's a real problem with the timing of this legislation. Yeah, yeah, it's May by the time this thing passes through Congress and FDR signs it, which means it's past seeding season. We're gonna have to plow under 10 million acres. Okay, um, do prices start to rebound under the AAA? Yes. Yes, but who doesn't like the AAA? Good. Uh, what court case did they test the constitutionality with? U.S. v. Butler. Good. U.S. v. Butler. Um, and U.S. v. Butler uh, deems what unconstitutional? <laughs> well, that processing tax, but by default, the entire AAA. Okay. So, did the did the paradigm shift work though? Yes. Yeah. Did farmers continue to reduce production? No. No. They're going to, once that regulation is off, they're going to start producing a lot again, and what happens to the price? It drops back down. Okay. So, talked uh, employment. Employment, the triple C. What does triple C stand for? Civilian Conservation Corps. Good, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, what types of jobs is the Civilian Conservation Corps dealing with? Say it again. Conservation. conservation. A lot of it is construction. Remember, we talked about um, watershed management, planting trees. Uh, we talked about that, that that stone shack that's up on top of, of Blood Mountain. Um, you know, those are the type of projects they're working for. Um, are you getting paid a lot? No. no. You know, what do we say? Thirty bucks a month. No, that's not going to make you filthy rich. But did these people have jobs before? No, and so we, we, we kind of see that as a positive there. Um, now, that's the triple C, FARA, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. Are they given jobs? No, remember, they're given money, something like $500 million. Half of it's going to the states. States have to match $3 to one. The other half goes to who? Swing states, good, yeah. Uh, FDR, we really see him using this as a political tool for re-election. Um, we also talked the CWA, remember that's just to get us through the winter. Um, CWA, uh, what do we say, it pumped $833 million back into the economy, employed over 4 million people. What types of jobs are those? Yeah, the renovation type stuff, all right? It's not going to be around for, for a long time. Uh, at least not as long as the triple C, uh, but we see this as an effort to to curb the unemployment. All right. TVA says there it's the greatest hydroelectric project in history. What do you got to say about that, Bob? <coughs> What's the TVA? What, what 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 are we trying to do here? Do what? Yeah. How many dams are we going to build? Twenty. Twenty. Okay. Um, and again, to harness those natural resources within this uh, the, the the Tennessee River Basin watershed area. Okay. Um, good. And remember that thirty some odd percent of the country that didn't have power was largely in the southeast, and so this is going to be providing a tremendous amount of power um, for a long, long time. NIRA, what does that stand for? Good, National Industrial Recovery Act. Um, remember, industries in the same boat as, as farming in terms of that overproduction and underconsumption, which means the prices are, and people are, the workers, yeah, they're being laid off. Um, and so the NIRA, uh, remember, comes in with all this regulation, trying to raise prices by doing what? Lowering what? Lowering production. There you go, lowering production. Um, what's the problem with the NIRA? Yeah, it, you know, it really is a, a bit of government overreach. Who's going to test the constitutionality of the NIRA? Good, check their poultry. Uh, remember, check the poultry was selling sick chickens. Um, NIRA came in, shut them down. Why did the Supreme Court vote 9 0 to back up Schechter? 
Yeah, they're selling within the state, intrastate, not interstate. Um, and uh, federal government can only regulate what type of trade? Interstate. Interstate trade. Good. Which one was deemed unconstitutional first? NIRA or AAA? In IRA. Okay, good. Now, that brings us right into our critics. Okay? Um, what I want you guys to understand is that the critics come from both the right and the left. Look, there's Huey. Hi, Huey. Alright, if we take a look, alright, what I've got here on the board is, is really, I guess, the political spectrum. Um, Whenever you hear the talking heads talk about, oh, this person's far on the left, this person's far on the right, what they're talking about is this, all right? When you hear people say, oh, Obama, he's so far left, he's a communist. The United States typically vacillates in that bubble right there. But again, we know that the talking heads, they say things just because it's, well, they can. And so when they say they're far left, people immediately believe Vroom, that he's a communist, all right? When you hear people say, oh, he's so far right, he's fascist, Vroom. They're over there. Now, really, it doesn't matter who the president is. We vacillate somewhere in that bubble. I've got it out on a line there. Really, this thing could be a circle, but it's easier to draw on a line. But it's a circle. You figure it out. It's almost like I know a little bit more than I did about the Gilbert's age. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, Bob. Love you, Bob. Subscribe. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> two types of critics. Two types of critics. Um, those who think that he has has not gone far enough. The people that think that that FDR has not gone far enough, they would be on the left. They want him to do more. Okay. Uh, the people think that, that the people that think he's gone too far are people on the right. Now, does that mean that the people that are on the right or left are totalitarian, fascist, or socialist communists? No. We're in this bubble, and again, you know, depending on on the leadership at the time, we vacillate somewhere in that bubble. Okay. So let's talk about some of these critics. One, this guy, Huey Long. Okay. Huey, yeah, Huey is, is from Louisiana and he's on the left, okay? With Huey being on the left, does he think that FDR has gone too far or not far enough? Not far enough, not far enough. good. Um, 1928, Huey Long was elected governor of Louisiana and really established himself as an enemy of big business. He really pushed a lot of that progressive legislation uh, that, that we talked about in the 19-teens and 1920s. Um, in 1930, he would be elected into the Senate, um, and, and in 1932, Long actually supported FDR for president, okay? Uh, he went to FDR, um, said, hey, I want to campaign for you. Uh, he had these great ideas is that he was going to hop on a train uh, and, and fix these loudspeakers to the train and ride all across America shouting how great FDR and his plans were. FDR let him campaign in Arkansas and Mississippi. They had a combined electoral vote of it doesn't matter. Okay. So, um, but we see that. Um, so, uh, he, oh, it, it, oh, it says in my notes here, also he allows him to campaign in North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, and Nebraska. Again, are those electorally important states? No, I'm sure that the bison loved Huey Long's speeches. Okay, now when it came down to Long and the New Deal, he opposed some, he supported others. All right, he was against the Emergency Banking Act, and his argument was that it did not help rural banks. Okay, um, he uh, he didn't like the Economy Act, the AAA, or the NIRA. Um, and really what we see by 1933-1934, that relationship between Long and FDR uh, got real tense. October of 33, Long says that he officially is split from FDR's bandwagon. Okay? Long's on the left. He believes FDR what? 
needs to go farther. Okay. Um, what Long wants to do is redistribute the country's wealth. Okay. He wants to see a redistribution of wealth. In 1934, he's going to publish a book called Share Our Wealth. Okay. Share Our Wealth. Uh, in this in this publication, he he wants to revise the tax code. He wants to limit a person's wealth to five million dollars. Okay, you are the most any one person could have was five million dollars. If you had more than five million dollars, the government would come in and confiscate all the overages. All right, your yearly income would be limited to one million dollars. If you made more than a million dollars, the government would take the overages. Okay. With all that extra money that had been seized, his idea was that the government would distribute five thousand dollars to each home. Okay, this is enough at the time. They thought enough for ordinary conveniences. Okay, the ordinary conveniences of home ownership. Not only would they distribute $5,000 to each home, the government would also guarantee an annual income of somewhere between $2,000 and $2,500. If you listen to some of the talking heads today, they're talking about this. Okay, they're talking about this. Understand, when you hear the talking heads today talk, it's not new. All right, this is not a new idea. Um, People keep talking about it about every decade or two. You'll hear people talk about this stuff. Mathematically, it doesn't work. Okay, But the share our wealth, um, it also would support a hope-like scholarship program for college. Um, but Huey never sends share our wealth to Congress. Okay, he never sends it to Congress. Um, and I think that's largely because it had problems. Okay, It's got problems. Uh, he never said how the money was to be distributed out. He never said how it would be liquidated. And he never did the math. Again, I told you, we're going to see this over and over and over through history, and the math never works. Okay. Now, just because the math doesn't work, does that mean that it's not going to be attractive to a lot of people? Yeah, a lot of people like it. But we've already talked about most people are. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, we're going to see pro-so, share our wealth groups, springing up everywhere. Um, Long is going to start campaigning against FDR, saying FDR doesn't care about the poor people. Um, and really, it, it was somewhat threatening to FDR. FDR really wouldn't have to worry about it for very long, because in September 1935, follow me here, in Louisiana, the judge's brother's cousin, you got that? Yeah. Got the judge, his brother's cousin. Yeah. I don't know how that doesn't make it also the judge's cousin, but whatever. I'm Ron Burgundy. If it's in my notes, I read it. Okay. Um, shot and killed Huey Long on the steps of the courthouse. Okay, so not an issue anymore. But he's a shining example of one of those those on the left. <laughs> These people are terrible. These people are terrible. So, another critic, another critic that we've got, this guy, crazy old Father Charles, Charles Coughlin, okay, Father Charles, uh, Coughlin, man this dude's crazy, uh, for real, uh, he's the radio priest uh, from Michigan, he was on the right, if he's on the right that means he believes what? Yeah, thinks that he's gone too far. In, in the 1920s, he started broadcasting his sermons on the radio. Remember, I told you that the radio is a big deal in the 1920s. Um, in 1930, he starts politicizing his sermons, okay, and really lashing out on communism. He's going to lash out on communism because, as we've discussed in class, communism is evil and nasty. Say it loud enough so everybody can hear. Evil, evil wicked, wicked and nasty. nasty. That's right, and don't you forget it. Alright, um, 1932, FDR uh, met Father Charles Coughlin, and, and really Coughlin started supporting FDR quietly. Okay? After the election, Coughlin's going to start supporting FDR um, publicly, okay? um, both FDR and the New Deal. He is going to send endless letters to FDR saying, hey, I got great ideas, listen to me. 
Okay. Um, he basically is Eminem's Stan. You guys know that song? Yeah. yeah. You know where he writes letters and, 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 and Eminem never gets back to him and he goes crazy? That's Father Charles Coughlin. Okay? That's Charles Coughlin. Um, so, 1934, uh, Coughlin is going to become very political when he comes out with the National Union for Social Justice. Okay? In this National Union for Social Justice, he is going to denounce the gold standard. He denounces the gold standard and wants to re-monetize U.S. money. Hence why the propaganda piece for the National Union for Social Justice were hammering out what? Bolshevism and money. Gold. Okay. So, um, is FDR ever going to write back? No. No. And Coughlin starts to get really disenchanted. Okay. He starts becoming very, very disenchanted with, with FDR. Uh, in 1935, the National Union for Social Justice is going to officially break with FDR. Okay, breaks with FDR. Um, and, and what we see is after this break, Coughlin and, and the, the National Union for Social Justice is really going to start moving right very quickly. Okay? They're going to start moving to the right very, very quickly. Coughlin is going to start on his radio show, start praising the, the leadership abilities of Hitler and Mussolini. He's going right. Um, and, and the National Union for Social Justice will begin to be identified as a fascist organization. All right. Um, in 1940, we decide, all right, we can't have your communist Bolshevism on the radio, we also can't have your fascism. And so in 1940, we kicked Coughlin off the radio. Okay? But, no, he thought that he'd gone too far. Yum. I like coughing. There he is. The doc. Dr. Townsend, all right? Dr. Francis Townsend. Uh, he's a dude from California, and he is on the left. People on the left believe what? He's got to do more. All right, now, Dr. Townsend here has got a plan for elderly relief, okay? A plan for elderly relief. Uh, it is known as old age revolving pensions, okay? OARP. So... You've got old age revolving pensions uh, in your reading. I think a couple times it refers to it as the Townsend Plan. Understand they are synonymous with each other. Okay. 1934, Francis Townsend is going to start pushing his, his plan for, for elderly relief, OARP. Now, at this point, FDR's got no plan for, for, uh, for the elderly. Okay. Social Security is not going to come out until 1935. This is 1934, and so we kind of see it as a precursor. Now, the, the central ideas of this OARP is that everybody who was over the age of 60 would retire immediately. Okay, they would retire immediately. <coughs> Once you uh, turn 60, you would start receiving a monthly payment of $200. Okay, $200. Now. With that $200, you had to spend it. You couldn't just sit there and hoard your money that's coming in from the government. In order to get $200 the next month, you got to spend the first $200. Okay? Um, this $200 that people were getting would be paid by taxes on business transactions. Now, the idea there is that that money would continue to get pumped into the economy and that you would have no more job competition from anybody who smelled like mothballs. Okay? If you're an old person, you might smell. If not, good on you. Um, I love old people. Hi, Mom. <laughs> uh, so, we're going to see pro Townsend groups spring up everywhere. We're going to see they've got buttons. Uh, 5,000 pro Townsend groups are going to spring up nationwide. Um, they've got a weekly newsletter. Letter, letter. Uh, they've got big support um, and power, especially in California. Okay? 
uh, OARP groups, these Townsend groups, are, are going to help elect congressional uh, delegates to California's Congress. Um, OARP actually did make it to the U.S. Congress. Okay, it made it to the U.S. Congress, uh, but mathematically, it did not work. Okay, it didn't pan out mathematically, and it's not really a big deal because, as we already talked about, one year later, 1935, we're going to push out what? Social Security. And we'll get to that down there. All right. Who's next? All 19 member, Upton Sinclair. All right. We've seen this guy before. Where have we seen him before? Yeah, he wrote The Jungle, which means that he was a what of the 19 teens? There you go. Okay. Raking up my... So, um, Upton Sinclair, novelist, lifelong socialist. He's on the right or the left? Definitely on the left. 1933, he wants to get epic in poverty in California. Okay. In poverty in California. Now... Epic was very, very radical for the U.S. Okay, at this time, really even today, uh, pretty radical for the U.S. It would put the control of production in the workers' hands. When the workers have control of production, we call that? That's uh, somewhere in, over here, you know, between communism and socialism right there. Okay. So, um... Basically, what we would do is the states would seize all abandoned land and buildings and give it to farmers and workers. Okay, so that the the control of production would actually be in the workers' hands. Upton uh, really believed in this idea. He wanted uh, California to vote on Epic. In 1934, he runs uh, for the governor. The governor. Ugh. It's like, oh, we won't do that again. Um, 1934, he runs to be the governor of California. Um, and, and he changes his party affiliation from the Socialist Party to Democratic Party. Okay. Um, to the Democratic Party. Um, in 1934, he wins the primaries. Okay. Wins the primaries, really running on a platform of epic. Okay. Um, Early on, Californians are supporting Upton here. Uh, but Upton wants FDR support. He wants the support. In September of 1934, Upton is going to go and meet with FDR. FDR looks at this plan of epic and says, Yeah, bruh, that's called socialism. Matter of fact, that might even be communism. I can't get down with that. All right. Uh, FDR refuses to support Upton. When FDR refuses to support Upton, are Californian Democrats going to support Upton? No. He was winning the primaries. As soon as FDR says no, Upton loses the election. Okay. So, um, but again, we see him saying we need to do more. Liberty League. Thanks FDR is Bolshevik, meaning they're on the right or the left. Yeah, yeah they're definitely on the right. Okay. Um, the Liberty League was founded in the summer of 1934. Said FDR had gone too far. He had gone well beyond his constitutional limits. They said that FDR and his New Deal programs uh, were creating class conflict. We take a look at this propaganda piece. What does the Liberty League think about FDR's New Deal? Socialism. Yes, that it is socialism. All right. Um, a lot of Liberty Leaders were actually Democrats. Okay, Al Smith. Um, remember, he was the the Democratic nominee in what twenty eight, former governor of, of New York. He was one of the leaders of this Liberty League. Okay, um, corporate America is really going to support the Liberty League. Um, and they stand firm against a lot of these New Deal policies because they think it's all Bolshevik. Bolshevik. Good. It's a fun word to yell. Bolshevik! So, 
FDR's got a lot of, of critics, okay? And it's not all from one side. He's really getting blasted by both sides. Um, and, and so it makes this, this election here, the election in 1934, uh, interesting. 1934 is what kind of an election year? Midterm election year. And what's up for grabs in a midterm? Not half. All of the House and how much? A third of the Senate. Remember, it's staggered. So, a third of the Senate and all the House is up for re-election. Uh, remember, we've already been through the first New Deal, the 100 days, those 15 pieces of legislation that got pushed through in the first 100 days. And so, we really see this election as being a litmus test of are the people in favor. Okay? Uh, Democrats going in control the White House, they control both houses um, in Congress, and so it was, everybody assumes that the Democrats stood to lose some seats. Democrats actually picked up seats in both houses. Okay? Uh, they're going to control the House 319 to 103, and the Senate 69 to 25. Do they have two-thirds majorities in case anything gets weird? Absolutely. Okay. What we see here in this midterm election is FDR is actually getting a more liberal Congress. All right? A more liberal Congress than before. Um, in fact, 34 members of Congress are considered more liberal or further to the left than FDR himself. Okay? And FDR arguably is one of the furthest left-leaning presidents we've ever had. Okay, so um, FDR feels real good. Okay, he feels real good, and and when he picks up seats, he's probably believing that the people want what? Yeah, they want more New Deal legislation. Okay. Is the season. So, with this new Congress, FDR is going to start rolling out the second New Deal. Okay, second New Deal. Uh, this new wave of legislature uh, really considered more liberal than, than, than the first New Deal, um, or really than what was going on in the first hundred days. Um, and, and remember, the, the first New Deal, the central philosophy of the first New Deal was the three R's. What were the three R's? Relief, reform, recovery. recovery. Okay. The central philosophy of the second New Deal now is work relief. Okay. It's all centered on work relief. Uh, we can see the major pieces of legislation that are going to come out in that second New Deal. And of course, we'll hit them all right here. Nineteen thirty-five. Nineteen thirty-five. FDR is going to create the Works Progress Administration. Okay, the WPA. Works Progress Administration uh, really fun uh, functioned with construction projects. Okay, construction jobs and projects. Um, now, the WPA was not allowed to compete with private industry. Um, it created new jobs, uh, but its critics said that these jobs were not worthwhile. Okay? Um, the WPA is being administered by Harry Hopkins. Remember, we saw him leading what was it, FARA and the CWA. He is now in charge of the WPA. Okay? Um, the WPA employed 8 million Americans. Uh, at that time, 8 million Americans represented somewhere around one-fifth of the population. Okay? About a fifth of the population was working for the WPA. And, and in its entirety, it would pump $11 billion back into the economy. These jobs are mostly in what? What sector? Construction. Uh, the WPA is going to be responsible for building uh, somewhere around 2,500 hospitals. 6,000 schools and paving half a mile, I'm sorry, half a million miles of rural roads. Okay? 
Okay, that's the types of things that the WP are doing. Um, now, remember, I told you that that the critics um, got on them. Uh, critics said that the WPA coddled their workers, that they gave high salaries for easy, slow work, um, and the critics really didn't even call it the or the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. They called it "We Poke Along." Okay, what they're probably going after here uh, are jobs that were titled Federal Project One jobs. Okay. These Federal Project One jobs hired professionals. They hired uh, professional playwriters and plays. They hired historians. Why? Why would FDR in all this want to hire historians and playwrights? Yeah. What is the value of having of employing playwrights and historians in, in a society. Yeah. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present now controls the past, right? Listen to more Rage Against the Machine, people. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. At least it'll make you think. Um, so, um, you know, we, we, we've got to craft a reality. You know, we've got to craft a reality, especially since in this bubble, which direction are we, we trending? To the left. Okay, we're trending left. Okay, and so you've got to legitimize that rule. And that's what playwrights, historians do. Okay? Now, um, this really, okay, the WPA really make some some changes okay to the American psyche okay it makes changes to the American psyche this really becomes because we're employing about one-fifth of the population what we're seeing is that with the WPA it's the first time government that people believe at least that government is responsible for providing employment if we think back all the way through the rest of, of our history Whose responsibility is it for you to get a job? Yourself. Yourself. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, put your nose to the grindstone and and don't be a baby. Okay. Now with this WPA, has that idea changed? Yes. Now people are believing it's government's responsibility to solve our problems, to give us jobs. Okay. Now this WPA, like I said. Created in 1935, it would last until 1943. Okay, so got the WPA going on. Um, we also have the National Youth Administration. Okay, National Youth Administration is another one uh, going after employment opportunities. 1935, the National Youth Administration is going to provide high school and college age students with jobs. All right. Um, most of these jobs are going to be clerical in nature. Um, it's going to employ, in terms of college, it's going to employ something somewhere around 600,000 uh, college-age students. And these are all work studies programs. If you're studying to become an educator, you'll probably get a job where? In a school. If, if you are studying business, you'll probably become, you know, get a job as an intern doing what? Yeah, something clerical with, with a business, all right? Um, but it's not just for college, it's also for high school. Uh, the National Youth Administration would employ 4.5 million high school age youth, all right? Um, this would be a successful agency in terms of getting uh, young people employed, uh, and it's also different than what we've seen with, say, the Triple C. We take a look at these pictures here. Uh, who's working? Colored people. There you go. All right. Um, even even African Americans are being employed. Where a lot of these others, uh, you know, remember we're still living in that separate but equal, that Plessy versus Ferguson, um, Triple C discriminated. The National Youth Administration will not. We okay? Okay. So. There we go. Um, a lot of this, again, focused on 
on trying to, to uh, deal with employment and, and creating jobs. And then we get Social Security. Social Security um, is there to address elderly relief. Okay? Um, this really is, is supplemental to who's failed plan. Dr. Townsend. Okay? Um, what this Social Security Act does, yes, it addresses elderly relief, uh, but it laid the groundwork for the modern welfare state. Okay? Social Security Act 1935 lays the groundwork for the modern welfare state. Uh, and it does this by creating a system uh, for old age pensions. Okay? Now, originally, it was employer and employee uh, were obligated to comply. Okay, they were obligated to comply, and it was financed by uh, taxes on, on, on your pay. Okay? Um, anybody have a job where you get a, a, an actual pay stub? Okay. Then, then if you look, you'll see uh, in your taxes, where, they, where you show taxes, you can see how much money they're taking out. If you get paid under the table, good. Don't do something silly and get that money taxed. Can I say that? I just did. So, um, financed by the taxes. Initially, it was one percent of the employer. I'm sorry, the employee's pay was matched by the employer. Uh, today, I want to say it's around six point two percent. Okay, so six point two percent of of your pay is matched by your employer. Um, theoretically, theoretically, this is like a savings account for your retirement. The idea here is, is you pay into Social Security your whole life, and then at age 65, when you retire, you could start receiving benefits, a pension, coming back to you. Okay? Um, the idea at the time was you get out what you put in. Now, today that's problematic. Okay, today that's problematic. You've got less people paying into it than you have people taking out of it. Is that a recipe for success? No. Okay, absolutely not. And if we looked at the, uh, the bank account for Social Security, you would find a tremendous amount of congressional IOUs. Okay, it's one of Congress's favorite places to borrow money from. Now, Social Security Act is also going to add, I uh, have some add-ons. Okay. It's not just for father time here. Okay? Um, some of the add-ons is going to be aid for dependent children. Okay? Aid for dependent children. Um, so, we see here, when an insured worker dies leaving, uh, dependent children and a widow, both mother and children, receive monthly benefits until the later it reaches 18. So, if something happens to me today, my wife and kid dynamite will be taken care of until KD is 18. Okay? So, hopefully nothing bad happens to you. If not, I blame you. Yeah, you right there. No, not Bob. It's not Bob's fault. I was just a troll. So, <laughs> he might be. Um, comment, Bob. <laughs> so, um, now, Social Security and its add-ons would quickly become the largest piece of, of the national budget. Okay? Quickly becomes one of the largest pieces. Now, off script. Social Security, don't expect for Social Security to be around by the time that you guys are ready to retire. All right? I don't expect Social Security will be around when I retire. And yes, I pay into Social Security. There are increasingly more businesses that, that will allow you to opt out of Social Security. If you are given the option to opt out of Social Security, I would encourage you to take it. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to have roughly 6.2% more income. What you need to do with that is take that and put it into an IRA, typically a Roth, or, or, or some other type of of retirement fund, all right? something that you will pull a tremendous amount of compound interest on uh, so that you can make yourself filthy rich when it's all said and done. Okay? Um, 
after we get done with the lecture, or if you people out there have questions about compound interest, Smooth said it was one of the most powerful things on earth, and Smooth is the man. Um, yeah, just ask me and I'll show you all about the, the joys or the negative consequences of compound interest. But, there you go. Um, I'll just keep paying into it. One of the last big things of this second New Deal is the Wagner Act. 1935, the Wagner Act is legislation for labor. Okay, it is very much pro-labor. Now, Wagner Act is going to create the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board. National Labor Relations Board is the entity that carries out the Wagner Act. <coughs> All right. Uh, Two major provisions, two major provisions of this Wagner Act. The first, it prohibited unfair labor practices. Okay, prohibited unfair labor practices. Uh, what we saw a lot is people were being fired if they joined a union. Wagner Act is going to prohibit people from being fired because of union membership. The second provision is it allowed workers to conduct secret ballot elections. Okay? If workers wanted union representation, they could have these secret ballot elections, um, and if a majority said, yes, we want to create a union, the union would come in and represent all the workers. Okay? And it would be the NLRB that would come in and supervise these secret ballots. All right? Now, is labor going to like this? Absolutely not. Labor says it's un-American, right? Under FDR, we are seeing a resurgence, as we can see here, an absolute resurgence of uh, union membership, okay? We'll see it will steadily decline uh, over time. But this right here, boom, boom. This is all the Frankie D era right here, all right? So, labor doesn't like it. But the North does. Okay. So, and you can see propaganda for for Ford employees. Okay. Now, Frankie D has done a, a tremendous amount in his first term. This election in 1936 comes around. Uh, Republicans have hope. Okay? Republicans have a tremendous amount of hope um, going into, into this election here. Um, Unemployment was still high. Prosperity had not been reached. The budget wasn't balanced. We've got a huge deficit. Um, and, and overall, businesses don't like the regulations. All right? They don't like the regulations, uh, meaning they don't like the NIRA. They don't like the Wagner Act. Does the New Deal get us out of the Great Depression? No, it doesn't. World War II gets us out of the Depression, all right? And that's what a lot of these people are arguing, okay? So, Republicans have hope. Um, they're going to have their nomination in, in Cleveland. Uh, it was remarkably harmonious. Hoover spoke at the convention, got an enthusiastic response. Um, but then when they got to the candidates, they didn't really have a whole lot in the cupboard, okay? They're really were no prominent governors. You had a couple people, you had Alf Landon. Uh, Alf Landon was the governor of Kansas. Um, you know, the biggest thing for him, he had been elected in 32 and 34. So, hey, he got elected as, as a Republican governor in Kansas. How many electoral votes does Kansas have? Like three or four, okay? So again, an insignificant uh, state. Sorry, Lane. Um, you got Charles McNary, a senator out of Oregon, Arthur Vandenberg, senator out of Michigan. Uh, but we're going to go with the governor. We're going to go with Alf. Uh, all name team member Alf Landon's going to win on the first ballot. There's Alf. He looks like an Alf. Um, he gets paired up with a guy named Knox, who is uh, actually a, not even a politician. He's the publisher of the Chicago Daily News. Um, but they're going to tab him. He's a former uh, bull, bull mooser and rough rider. So trying to kind of <coughs> resurrect the, 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 the Teddy 
era. Okay. Um, platform for Landon and, and the Republicans. Their slogan was, quote unquote, America in peril. They're going to criticize the New Deal. They're saying that FDR is turning this country into what? A socialist or a communist state. Is that true? No. But we are trending in which direction? Left. Left. Okay. Um, they said that uh, the New Deal took rights away from states that were reserved to the states. They said the federal government was too big and that the budget had to be balanced. June, Democrats get together in Philly. It really was a pointless gathering. Um, in this election, uh, or in this nominating convention, uh, the Democrats will once and for all get rid of that silly two-thirds rule. All right? They no longer play by the two-thirds rule. That starts in 36. Um, FDR and Garner are going to get renominated by acclamation. Um, after you know, they were nominated by acclamation, every single state seconded the nomination. Okay? Platform for FDR and the Democrats. They support continuing the New Deal. They, they come out and say they want to reduce government expenditures, but really that's just lip service. Okay? That's not true. Um, and they say they want neutrality in foreign disputes. What's starting to pick up over in Europe? Yeah, Germany's starting to make some moves, Italy's starting to make some moves, um, and Japan is starting to make some moves. Okay, we'll get into that tomorrow. Um, we've got a third party, the Union Party. Um, the Union Party is Father Coughlin's party. Okay, that's Father Coughlin, you know, uh, the crazy radio guy. Okay, this National Union for Social Justice. They're not calling themselves the Union Party. Um, they're going to go with the guy in the middle there, uh, William Lemke. He was in the U.S. House out of North Dakota. All right. Um, they're going to pair him up with a lawyer from, from Boston. Dude's name is O'Brien. Okay, not important. In the campaign, Landon's going to attack FDR's methods. FDR, for the most part, is going to absolutely ignore all opposition. <laughs> Because in 1936, the NAACP came out and publicly endorsed FDR. I mean, the NAACP publicly endorses a candidate, that basically, especially at this time, means that FDR is going to get all of what groups vote? Northeast. Well, he's going to get, he's going to get the nationwide, for the most part, uh, the black vote. Okay? So he feels real good. He feels real good. Um, what we're going to see is this is a shifting in voting patterns. Okay? This is a shifting in voting patterns. The black vote has historically, up until this point, always gone to the Republicans. Why? They freed them. There you go. Abe, Abe freed the slaves. He was a Republican. We see that switch right here. All right. Um, Democrat slogan was follow through uh, with FDR. Republican slogan was life, liberty, and landing. Okay. Uh, this was the first time for polls. The Literary Digest uh, reported that they thought Landon was going to win in a landslide. We look at this map and say, no. false. Okay. Yeah, false. Um, that's terrible. That's absolutely terrible. FDR only lost Maine and Vermont. Okay, that's absurd. Um, Democrats are also going to pick up more seats in both houses of Congress. They now own the Senate 76 to 16 and the House 331 to 89. Okay, the Republicans.